here. Rita Jeff Martin is our next meeting. She's going to be here at 11, so just a little okay. bit more. Okay. Um, so, do I need to start from the basics, what BDS is and so on? Okay. Um, uh, BDS is uh, centered around the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions that came out on July 9th, 2005. Um, that was not the beginning of the Palestinian boycott movement, however. It was a culmination of decades of Palestinian uh, boycott initiatives. Uh, for, for more than a century, Palestinians have used boycott uh, to counter settler colonialism and later Israeli occupation. Uh, so it wasn't something that um, was completely new, out of the blue. It was a culmination, as I said. So the main inspiration for the BDS movement in 2005 uh, was the Palestinian initiatives for boycott, um, especially in the first intifada, which was between 1987 to 1993. In the first intifada, the boycott was a main form of struggle adopted by Palestinian society uh, against the occupation. The famous Beit Sahur, I don't know if you've been to Beit Sahur, Bethlehem area. It, it's a Christian town near Bethlehem. Uh, they had the most famous um, boycott of paying taxes to the military authorities, no taxation without representation. They used that uh, slogan. <clears throat> and that went on for months, and the, their furniture were, were confiscated, the refrigerators, cars, and I mean, the Israeli occupation authorities tried everything in the book to stop them. Uh, but that was a very famous uh, tax strike um, and, and the form of boycott. Also boycott of Israeli goods, boycott of Israeli institutions was very popular then. <clears throat> so in 2005, uh, Palestinian civil society felt that the world was failing us, basically. It was a year after the International Court of Justice at The Hague had decided that the wall, Israel's wall, and colonies built on occupied Palestinian territory were both illegal but a year after the ICJ ruling on July 9th, the world had done nothing to stop Israel from construction of the wall, at the very least. So we felt if they cannot make Israel stop constructing the wall, we can never imagine to regain our basic rights under international law through the so-called international community, the states, the hegemonic powers in the world, and the UN controlled by the US government. So there's no hope. So we have to appeal to civil society. This is how the whole philosophy of BDS came about. And this is very inspired by the South African anti-apartheid movement. So the main inspiration is the Palestinian civil resistance, popular resistance that has gone on, had gone on for decades. And then the South African anti-apartheid movement, the main modern inspiration for our movement. And we're in touch continuously with South African uh, leaders who had led the anti-apartheid struggle. So their advice is very important to us. Their experiences uh, are very important to us, despite the differences. It's, it's never copy-paste in such struggles. It's inspiration, it's uh, learning, it's um, uh, common principles, but it's never copy-paste. You cannot copy tactics or strategies from another struggle. You learn from them and you develop your own. <clears throat> and, and the BDS movement is very much our own. It's a Palestinian movement with Palestinian strategies, Palestinian tactics, and the Palestinian leadership. The leadership of the BDS movement, the BDS National Committee, or BNC for short, is the largest coalition of Palestinian civil society today. By far, it's the largest. All the major trade unions, women's unions, political parties, uh, NGO networks, everyone is in it, pretty much. So it's a huge representative of Palestinian civil society. And it's not just civil society in the occupied West Bank, Gaza, including East Jerusalem, but also Palestinians in Israel, the 1.2, 1.3 million Palestinian citizens of Israel, and the Palestinian refugees, the great majority of the Palestinian people who are in exile. And the BDS call specifically addresses the three basic rights of those three communities, those three segments of the Palestinian people, ending the 1967 occupation and colonization, the settler settlements and so on, <coughs> including the war. Uh, and uh, that's number one. Number two is ending the system of, of legalized racial discrimination in Israel against its own non-Jewish citizens, which is a form of apartheid, according to the international definition of apartheid, and I'll get to that later. Third, uh, the right of return for refugees in accordance with UN Resolution 194. These three basic fundamental rights together 
uh, constitute really the minimal requirements for Palestinians to exercise our right to self-determination. Without those three aspects, we will not we will not have addressed the basic rights of the Palestinian people. Now, this may come as a surprise to many because, and I wouldn't blame you, because in the West, for many, many years, you got used to the definition of the Palestinians, the Palestinian people being reduced to only those in the West Bank and Gaza. But those are one third of the Palestinian people. These are not the Palestinian people. The West Bank and Gaza together are about one third of the Palestinian people. <coughs> Two thirds are in exile or citizens of Israel. The great majority are in exile. And in fact, the great majority of the Palestinian refugees in exile are just around the historic Palestine area, Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. The great majority of refugees are in that area. <coughs> um, as you saw in the Nakba uh, commemoration this year, 2011, the 63rd commemoration of the Nakba, thousands of Palestinian young refugees came to the ceasefire lines in the Golan Heights and to the borders in, in South Lebanon to try to breach those borders to go home, to reclaim their basic right to go home as refugees, as all refugees around the world have a right to go home. <clears throat> and Palestinian refugees have won that right through UN resolutions, which by the way, even the US government had supported for many, many years. For many years, US government supported Resolution 194. And Resolution 194, which calls for the return and um, other reparations for Palestinian refugees, was one of the conditions for Israel's acceptance at the UN. Now you hear a lot about the Palestinian state trying to get accepted as a member in the UN. Well, the Israeli state was accepted as a member at the UN based on that main condition, that they have to accept the right of return for refugees. And they did. The Israeli government representative then agreed to that condition, and only after that was Israel accepted as a full member of the UN. <clears throat> so if people think of campaigns to freeze Israel's membership in the UN until it respects that right, that's something that can be done if there's enough will uh, by enough states around the world. So the, the BDS call, as I said, focuses ending occupation, ending apartheid, and the right of return, and therefore addresses the basic rights of Palestinians under international law. International law and basic human rights principles are the only two uh, foundations for the movement. They're the only two references for the movement. There's no other agenda in the BDS movement except international law and respect for human rights. So everything we publish, everything we do, uh, is based on those two foundations, and we're very, very consistent about that. Um, as a nonviolent movement by definition, boycott is as, as nonviolent as it gets. Um, and base, being based on international law and human rights, the movement was very successful in appealing to a much more mainstream audience than we've ever had in the Palestine Solidarity movements around the world. <clears throat> in other words, since the BDS call in 2005, the circle of groups, civil society organizations around the world that are in support of Palestinian rights has mushroomed, has really grown beyond any bounds we've known in the past. In the past, most of those in solidarity with Palestine were on the left and the very, very solid left, nothing close to the mainstream. Uh, because in the West, left is no longer close to the mainstream, as you all know. It has shifted way to the right. <clears throat> so the left is on the margins to a large extent in most countries, especially in the US, where it's almost non-existent in near the center. Um, but we managed to win trade union support, famous actors, famous musicians, bands, uh, intellectuals, academics, uh, and so on and so forth, breaking through the, the boundaries of, of mainstream, really. Um, some just quick examples of those breaches of the mainstream borders, so to speak. Uh, the Trade Union Congress in Britain, which represents 6.5 million workers. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the COSATO, the South African Trade Union Congress, is the first and foremost among the supporters of Palestinian uh, BDS movement in the trade union movement around the world. Uh, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions also supported BDS. And several unions in Canada, France, Italy, Belgium, Norway, Spain, other, India, Turkey, and of course the latest and, and very significant addition to this list of an, trade union endorsers was CUT, 
the Brazilian Trade Union Congress, which represents about 22 million workers. So it's no small trade union movement. So among trade unions, the, the, the support for BDS has grown tremendously. But since the attack on Gaza, since the assault on Gaza, <clears throat> and the massacre committed by Israel there, the war crimes and, and crimes against humanity, BDS has grown very fast since the attack on Gaza. Um, there are many reasons for this. The Goldstone Report, the so-called Goldstone Report, helped bring awareness of what Israel is doing to the Palestinians to a wide international stage. So people became much more aware of what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. And then you got people like Archbishop Desmond Tutu, a fervent supporter of, of BDS, coming out and saying, we've never had such repression under apartheid in South Africa. It's much, much worse for the Palestinians. We never had F-16s bombing our Bantustans. We never had such wide-scale massacres committed by the South African apartheid government as the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians. So when you have such moral authorities making this comparison and saying it's much, much worse in the Israeli case, it rang a bell with people. People in the civil rights movement in the US started seeing comparisons. Alice Walker is among the most famous in doing so. When she came out in support of BDS, she compared with the Rosa Parks initiated boycott that Martin Luther King led, uh, the bus uh, boycott and so on. So she made that connection and brought this home to a wide public in the US that wouldn't have made any connection. What does civil rights in the US have to do with the Palestinian BDS movement? So Alice Walker was among the first to make this very solid connection, I think. <clears throat> so between South Africa, the anti-apartheid movement, and the US civil rights movement, the connections started to become much more popular, much more um, publicized and mainstream.